Hello, V. Anton Sprawl here again, talking about how you can learn to think like a programmer. In this episode, we'll be talking about bottom up problem solutions, specifically with dynamic programming, but it's a general idea that you can apply in other areas as well. So, what do we mean by bottom up? Well, the most natural way of thinking about recursion, for example, is top down. Consider the problem of finding the largest value in an array of integers. Of course, this problem is easily solved without recursion, but it makes a good example to show the different approaches. Suppose we wanted to do a divide and conquer solution. We would conceptually divide the array in half and make recursive calls to find the largest value in each half. Then the largest value in the entire array is the largest of those two returned values. And here's a function that implements this idea. We've got parameters to specify the first and last positions in the array. So the array itself is always the same array with the same number of values, and we just manipulate these parameters to tell the function which portion of the array it should process. So the function starts by seeing if those positions are the same, which means there's only one value under consideration, and which by definition is the largest value. So that's our base case that will end the recursion. Otherwise, we find the midpoint between the first and last positions in the array and make two recursive calls to find the largest value in each half of the array. And then we can return the larger of those two returned values. So that's top-down thinking. We start with the whole problem we want to solve and whittle it down to the point where it's trivial. Then turn around and build up these trivial results into a solution for the whole problem again. And this can be a powerful programming technique. Once you understand what I call the big recursive idea, which you can learn about in a previous video, you can use this concept to quickly find solutions to complex problems. But we can think about this approach in a different way. Now suppose we call this function with an array of eight integers. Well, the first thing this function is going to do is generate two recursive calls. And each of those will generate two more. And each of those will generate two more as well. So the first phase of this function's work is just generating all those recursive calls, just getting to the point where the calls are being made on individual items in the array. The function isn't really accomplishing anything until those calls on the single items return and it can start actually comparing values. Everything up to that point is just throat clearing. Once we understand that, we might think, oh, well, the first useful thing this code is going to do is pick out the larger of the first and second integers in the array, and then the larger of the third and fourth integers, and so on. And then it's going to compare those results against each other. Well, what if we wrote the code to do that directly instead of going through all that recursion? Well, that's bottom-up thinking, starting directly with the smallest piece of work we can and building up from there. That's the idea, but how do we actually code it? Here's one way. We've switched here from using arrays to using lists, which can efficiently grow as needed. If you've never used a C++ list before, here's a quick intro. We declare a list like this, and the type in angle brackets is the type of the item in the list, here, integer. We can see how many items are in a list with the size method. The front method returns the first item in the list, and pop front removes the first item. The pushback uh, adds a new item to the end of the list, and the last operation I'm using here is swap, which does just what it says. It swaps the contents of two lists. Quite handy. OK, so we start with all the original values in a list. What this code is going to do is repeatedly pull two numbers from the list and put the larger of the two numbers at the end of a second list. When the first list is empty, we copy the second list with the now empty first list and start the loop over again. This fulfills that bottom-up idea. We take the original values two by two and find the largest of each pair. Then we take those results two by two and find the largest of each of those pairs. This process continues until we're left with one number in the list, 
which is the largest number in the original list. So now let's think about dynamic programming. Here's the dynamic programming solution to the knapsack problem that I showed in a previous video. If you haven't watched that and you're not familiar with the dynamic programming concept, you might want to go back and watch that video first. Anyway, as you might recall, the idea behind this solution is that if we have a total possible weight of 30, for example, and we have items of weights 3, 5, and 7, we might start with an item of weight 3 and use recursion to find the best way to make use of the other 27 units of weight. And then we try the item with the 5 weight and use recursion to make the best use of the other 25 units. And finally, the item of 7 weight using recursion to make the best use of the other 23 units. With dynamic programming, though, we're going to keep track of all the intermediate values so that we never compute the same results twice. We can apply the bottom-up concept here as well. Instead of starting with the full weight of the knapsack, we could start by asking, well, what's the best way to make use of a knapsack with maximum weight 1? and then one with maximum weight 2, and so on. Because this is dynamic programming, we'll keep track of all the previous results, which means that when we're trying to compute the best use of, say, 10 units of weight, we'll have access to all the best results from weights 1 through 9. And in fact, to make the code a little simpler, we'll store all the way down to weight 0, which of course has to have a best use of 0. This function starts by creating an array just large enough to hold all the results up to the specified available weight. We set the first value in the array to 0, because a maximum weight of 0 means a value of 0. Then we have an outer loop that is going to compute the best value for each weight from 1 to the weight specified by the parameter. Inside this outer loop, we just run through each item. And if it's possible to add that item to the bag, we consider the effect of doing so. That is, we see how much value there is in the remaining weight. The maximum total value is what gets stored in that spot in our knapsack max value array. Then at the end, the result we need is the one in that last spot in the array. We just need to pull that value out before we deallocate the array and return it. And note that this function doesn't use recursion. It doesn't need it. You know, what recursion does is allow us to postpone finding an answer to a problem until we have the answer to one or more subproblems. Here, we're starting with the simplest subproblems and working up, so we can do the work directly. So both of these solutions to the knapsack problem are considered dynamic programming. But the original one was top-down, and the second one is bottom-up. Now, you might be wondering, is one of these solutions better than the other? Well, maybe. In terms of efficiency, as that is officially defined, and if you don't know what that means, you can check out another one of my videos on that too, but in terms of efficiency, they're both the same. Basically, they're linear in relation to the maximum weight in the sack, assuming that the mix of items doesn't change. But consider this. Suppose we start with a sack with a maximum weight of 30. The bottom-up approach is going to compute the best value of every possible maximum sack weight from 1 to 30. But depending on the mix of items we're working with, some of those intermediate values may not be needed for the final result. The bottom-up solution is going to compute every smaller problem, while the top-down solution will only compute the smaller problems we actually need. Now, the benefit of the bottom-up approach is that we avoid the overhead of the function calls using the recursion, but in general, the top-down dynamic programming approach will have better performance. You know, that said, the bottom-up approach is still useful to have in your toolkit. You know, the more approaches you have to problem-solving, the better chance you have to come up with a good solution. Consider the Fibonacci problem we discussed in a previous video. Here's the basic recursive implementation, which has you know, terrible efficiency. I'm going to go through this kind of fast, so refer to the previous video if you need more info about this problem and its solution. Now here's the top-down dynamic programming version we developed already. 
It's basically the same solution, except that we're storing each intermediate value as we compute it and using those pre-computed values whenever we can. But again, we could use a bottom-up approach because we know that in computing, you know, let's say the 10th number in the Fibonacci sequence, we're going to have to compute the previous nine values, right? So rather than starting at the top, we can start at the bottom with the first values in the sequence and just keep going until we reach our desired place in the sequence. So that looks like this, a bottom-up dynamic programming solution. But here's the thing, although we're keeping track of all the previous values in the sequence, we, we only really need to keep track of the last two numbers. In other words, to compute the fourth number in the sequence, we need to know the second and third numbers. And once we have the fourth number, we don't need to know the second number anymore. We'll never need it again. So we can modify the bottom-up dynamic programming solution so that we only keep track of the last two numbers in the sequence. After computing the latest number in the sequence, in this variable current number, we can copy last number to second last and then copy current number to last number. So we sort of slide the new number in, which results in bumping one number off at the other end, and we've always got the last two numbers in these variables. The point is, now we've given ourselves the benefits of the dynamic programming concept, which is linear time efficiency but we've avoided recursion altogether, and we've avoided needing an array to store intermediate values. So this is an important point to keep in mind about problem solving. You know, often problem solving is about seeing connections and analogies between different problems and different solutions. Dynamic programming in both its top-down and bottom-up forms isn't something you're gonna use on a daily basis. Still, when you need them, they can be of huge benefit, either in finding any solution or in finding a solution that's efficient enough to actually use. Furthermore, though, the ideas behind dynamic programming, mainly the idea of trying to store intermediate values long enough to use them again, you know, these kind of ideas can have useful application outside of solutions that are officially dynamic programming. So that's it. I hope this video helps you in your programming and problem solving. As always, please do like, share, and subscribe if this video was helpful, and feel free to suggest new topics. Thanks for watching.